Hello and welcome to Asian Cinema Season 2. This is the sequel to my original Asian Cinema Season 2017 where I took a month, in fact I think it was a five week period, and just absolutely annihilated my channel with themed reviews of films from around the continent of Asia, from Japan to Korea, China, uh, even to places like Iran and India. And this will be uh, very much following in the same suits as the first Asian cinema season. I'll probably have done an introduction video actually at this point, but this right now is the first official review, and it's the first film that really made me think and realize I need to do another one of these things. It was a lot of time and effort to do that first Asian cinema season, but it was time and effort, I believe, was very well spent as it was one of the great periods of discovery in my film watching life. So I hope that this Asian cinema season will be similar, but I already feel like it's been worth it because I've been working my way through the filmography of Naoko Ogigami. So what I'm going to do is review the films of hers that I have seen and talk about them and uh, and kind of go through her filmography. I'm not going to redo Close Net because I've already talked about that, but for most most of her filmography I'll have all bases covered and I'm really excited to get started and to talk to you all about this woman's movies. And we'll get right into it now with Naoko Ogigami's first feature film, I believe, from 2004, Yoshino's Barbershop. This is a story set in a, a small village in Japan in the country, and it is a beautiful location. First and foremost, what I love about this film, right out the gate, is just where it's set. Just seeing this beautiful kind of countryside, and the trees, and the hills, and the, the mountains that kind of frame the, the little village that all the characters live in. It feels like a very close-knit community, no pun intended, uh, where everyone knows each other. And the one defining characteristic that you'll instantly see when you look at just shots of this town and people walking around is that all the boys have the exact same haircut, a bowl haircut. And this comes from Yoshino's Barbershop. It is a certain hairstyle that has been kind of passed down from generation to generation. All the boys have the exact same haircut. And it's to do with kind of praying to a god on the mountain and things like that. But also it's just this very regimented view of how things must be done. And there's certainly a theme there, I think, to be explored of uh, whether that's the right thing to do, to follow the same set path of the people who've come before us, um, even if it doesn't make much sense in our modern, you know, present period, but to just kind of stick to traditions. Not that sticking to traditions is a bad thing, so it's an interesting discussion, I think, that you could take and apply to so many different things. And this one is a very light-hearted one, which is just, you know, the hairstyle of a young boy. Now, there's one woman who's kind of the, uh, the the matriarchal kind of woman of the whole village. It feels like she kind of rules the village in a way because she's the woman who does all the haircuts. She runs the barbershop, and, and that's kind of her mission. And she's very strict and stern about these haircuts. You know, at the beginning of the film, you see her checking all the boys' fringes, you know, with a ruler and things like that. She'll be there at the school gates checking that everyone's hair is in order, right? You need to come for another haircut soon. You know, she's very strict about it. And I guess our main character is the son of this woman. And this woman actually is an actress who appears in many of Ogigami's films I've seen as I've progressed through her filmography. And the actress's name is Masako Motai. And she is just a really interesting actress. I, I really like her in, in everything I've seen her in, actually. And I'll talk about her more as we get through these reviews. But I really like her here. She kind of has a... She, she's the, the stern, strict character, but there's a sense of fun to her at the same time. And there's also a, a really interesting kind of comedic beat, uh, or beats throughout the film, where we see her kind of almost doing this kind of... Uh, you know, she's willing things to happen. You'll just see her in these little moments on her own, you know, where she's kind of doing these movements and just kind of willing stuff to happen. And and it's, it reminds me very much of my fiance Connie, because uh, Connie has a, a really cute, I think, habit of whenever something is, is about to happen in life, like it could be anything. It could be like the cat's about to jump off the sofa. Connie will go, three, two, one. And often it doesn't happen, but when it does, she's like, "See, did you see that?" And it's it's so pointless and stupid. But you know, if if you if you if you do these things often enough, coincidence and kind of happenstance will make it seem as if you have this power. So I really like that characteristic in this woman, this hairdresser. But the main kind of crux of the story is that we have all these boys with the same haircut, and they don't really question it because everything they've ever known, it's just the way it is. 
and a boy transfers in from another town. I think he's from the city even, and he has bleached hair and it's cool and spiky and everyone can't quite believe it. You know, he's this kind of, this new kind of hot topic amongst the, the kids and, and even the, the adults, in fact. And he doesn't want to have his hair like a bowl haircut. He thinks it looks stupid, but also this young kid thinks, why should I conform? Like, this is a, this is a, this is infringing on my, my freedom of, you know, personality, basically. Like, I should be able to have my own haircut. It's something very personal. So he refuses to do it, and, you know, he, he kind of bunks off school because he doesn't want to get this haircut. And the young boys, you know, they, they look at him almost like an outsider, like, you know, who are you? You're not one of us. And I found it quite interesting and humorous that porn <laughs> was the gateway to this new kid being ingratiated into the, the core group of friends that we follow throughout the film, where have their own little den out in the woods and stuff. And it, it very much gave me the feel of uh, Stand By Me. You know, it, it's nowhere near as great of a film as Stand By Me, but it had that feeling of these kids kind of just going out and doing stuff themselves. And, um... Again, I, I say it was interesting because I was on Twitter recently and a fellow YouTuber, Rachel Wagner, she was talking about how she doesn't like it when films portray young boys looking at pornography and things like that as some kind of endearing thing. And I get where she's coming from, I really do, but I, I, I couldn't help but be amused by how the fact that this new kid with the bleached hair, you know, the kids aren't really, you know, they're not really warming to him or anything like that, he's not part of their friend group. When they find out that he has a stash of his dad's porn magazines, they're like, oh my god, and like, you're one of us now, come in, come in, come to the den, you know? <laughs> so I just thought that was kind of funny, and to me, being a guy and having grown up as a young boy, it's kind of true to life, and... Uh, you know, for the most part, I think fairly harmless. I mean, it depends on kind of the graphic, the the, the degree of graphic uh, nature in the pornographic magazines. You don't really see them. You just see the covers and stuff. But anyway, so it's about this this kid who, who refuses to have his hair cut, whether he's going to get the hair cut and whether he can kind of inspire his new friends to stand up against this woman who is so set on them having this haircut and whether they can turn things around and kind of make it be the status quo that people can have whatever hairstyle they want. And I, I thought it was a charming film. I, I absolutely loved it. It's very simple. Um, you know, it, it shot well, but you know, it really is helped by the gorgeous landscapes the, uh, the, the, you know, the where the town is set in the movie. But the acting is really good, and there's just uh, there's there's a great sense of um, uh, naturalism to a lot of the performances. It's always hard to tell when it's a language that's not your own. But I felt like I was watching kids, you know, I really did, and I believed in those characters, and I just had a blast following these young boys around and wondering, you know, how they were going to solve this dilemma of what do they do about the haircuts? Do they just sit back and and let it continue to happen, or do they do something about it? And will this woman who is so strict and set in her ways and very much rules kind of the authority of these haircuts in the town, will she see, you know, a, a difference in um, in ideals in these young boys, and will she decide to maybe, you know, bend the rules a little bit, or just break them completely and let the kids have whatever haircut they want? So I think it's a really interesting little micro story, you know, there's nothing too dramatic going on, but it's a really enjoyable film. And right from the get-go, I think, with Ogigami, I just think you can tell she's someone who is a really good storyteller. You know, this isn't a fantastic film, this isn't even a great film, but it's one that I loved and I had such a great time with and I will definitely return to again and again. Now that's my thoughts on the film. I want to now hand over to my good friend Daisuke Beppu to see what he thinks and thoughts of Yoshino's Barbershop. Greetings from Tokyo. This is Daisuke Beppu and I'd like to share with you just a few comments about the Naoko Ogigami film, uh, which is called Yoshino's Barber Shop. Now, I know that Luke has probably spoken about this already, uh, but if I might add just my own thoughts about it, I would say that this film is a really uh, fascinating one because of its balance uh, of many traits, I think. On the one hand, you have a uh, Japanese uh, small town uh, life, and it seems to be pretty uh, isolated. Uh, maybe it seems to be uh, very much um, uh, in, in the countryside of Japan, and uh, therefore it's very small. It's a, f a very small and focused community. And thus you have this notion of the traditions 
as being expressed by everyone or all the boys having the same haircut. Uh, so there is a real sense of uh, small town quaintness and also the importance of tradition, you know, whatever that means in the context of the film. And then on the other hand, you have this idea of modernism, of freedom, of sexual liberation, and of this idea of rebelling against the status quo. Uh, so you have this mix, which I think on paper or at least when you hear it for the first time, might sound very potentially volatile. Uh, but I would say that that, that kind of tension uh, is really uh, set off uh, quite masterfully, I should say, by the overall uh, feel and the environment and the world that is created by Ogigami. There is not a sense of volatility, I would say, but there is a real sense of this being a living, breathing place, and this being a world filled with characters, and Ogigami, as we have seen already, she lets her camera uh, let the ca characters breathe, so to speak, within this world. And you get this sense of character rather than uh, you know, poles uh, being represented uh, in terms of a metaphorical battle, uh, but instead you get a place that is a real place in an environment that is living and breathing, filled with these uh, uh, sort of three-dimensional characters uh, that have reasons behind what it is uh, they believe in and what they do. And so therefore I think it is a really uh, fascinating work, and uh, it's one that I think uh, focuses on the idea of um, like uh, uh, sort of a, a individuality versus uh, group and uh, the idea of um, uh, group solidarity. And I don't think the film takes one side over the other. I think there is this real tension. And I think this tension uh, is reflective of life in Japan in general. You know, there's not this what sense of individuality always reigns supreme over groupthink. Um, I think there's a sense in Japanese society where uh, this idea of the group uh, tends to be favored uh, in certain instances, whereas in other instances this idea of individual freedom uh, tends to be favored. So I think it really depends on the situation, and I think there is enough uh, nuance and enough uh, uh, three-dimensional depth in this film to make room for that uh, complex uh, nuance and uh, this idea of uh, things not necessarily being black and white. But at the same time, uh, the picture is painted in a way that is very pleasant, very rich, uh, very warm, and uh, quite respectful of the characters. So that is my take, uh, just my two cents on uh, Yoshino's Barbershop. Uh, anyway, I hope you're doing well, and please take care. Cheers. So there we go. That was our thoughts on Yoshino's Barbershop. And uh, I just, yeah, I, I greatly look forward to talking about more of this woman's work because I just, I, I really feel like she's becoming, or has become, one of my favorite directors now. So stay tuned for more reviews of Naoko Ogigami's filmography. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you, Daisuke, for taking part. And I'll see you in the next video. Hey, it's all right by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans of Carlin into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. But he's not quite as cool as you. Cause...